Good afternoon, everyone. I thank each one of you for taking time out to join our 2Q earnings call. Uh, like we've done in the past, we will take you through a structured presentation, and then uh, we will have about 35 to 40 minutes for Q&A uh, once we are done uh, with the presentation. Uh, this has already been uploaded, so I estimate most of you have already gone through it. But just to uh, expand on the uh, performance of the company uh, during the <laughs> during the second quarter, uh, I would say it was a great uh, sustained story of growth in the second quarter. Uh, like we said, we saw several historic highs. I will talk about them. Uh, expanding the business share across uh, both mutual funds and outside of mutual funds in terms of uh, how we got share. And then we achieved several key milestones uh, across businesses. Uh, you would have seen that we had reported uh, we have been sharing with you five mutual fund wins, uh, four uh, companies which are just starting off in the market. Now we was the fifth. Of these four, both Helios and Zeroda uh, went live. This was, of course, outside 2Q. This happened in October. But it's worth sharing with the, each one of you that uh, both of them have formally launched in the market. We expanded our count of uh, active AMCs, MFA AMCs that work with us. On the overall mutual fund AUM, uh, the first six months of this year and the quarter have been uh, the best ever in recent times in terms of absolute and uh, percentage expansion of assets. Uh, our overall assets at the end of the quarter stood over 32 lakh crore rupees. You see an over 32.2 trillion. Uh, this went up 20% year on year, and on a large base, uh, that's certainly uh, a very significant number. Uh, overall market share uh, continued at 68.5%. Our equity AUM crossed uh, 15 lakh crore, end of the quarter was 15.2. Uh, this registered a 28% growth year on year, as you are aware. And our equity market share. Uh, expanded by almost 120 basis points, so it's now 65.5 percent. A year back, this would have been 64 and some change. So that's been a sustained increase. Also, in the first quarter, we'd shown you our equity net sales market share, which was in the 90s in the first quarter, which obviously a 90 percent share of anything can look like an aberration. But uh, very happy to share with you that uh, it's holding out quite well. Uh, net sales is really the net money that comes into the market from investors. Uh, we had an 80% share uh, in the second quarter, and, and this is probably the reason why the uh, equity uh, asset market share has gone up. Uh, outside of uh, mutual funds uh, are overall, and I'm giving you a one-year picture from second quarter last year to this year, about a 3% or 300 basis points increase year to year, year in the share of non-MS revenue. This was in the range of 10%, just short of 10 one year back in the second quarter. It's now about 13%. How did this happen? Uh, Non-MF revenue, if I take absolute numbers, grew 47% year on year. Uh, if I take out the one-time contribution of Think360, uh, it is still 30%, which is a very salutary number. You know that we've been talking about an uh, overall uh, earnings compounding of 15% saying non-MF uh, should be growing in the 20s or beyond that. So this was a great occurrence, 30% uh, non-MF growth. In alternatives, uh, which has been a sweet spot for us, uh, we went past uh, 2 lakh crore or 2 trillion uh, overall assets uh, under management, under administration number. Uh, and then CAMS KRA, which is uh, a product where we were focused on mutual funds till about a uh, year and a half back. We started planning uh, a complete revamp of the platform and, and from a product perspective to stay ahead of the peers and also to make a strong go-to-market efforts. I think all of that has uh, has done very well. Uh, CAMS KRA has grown almost 100% in revenue in the last one year, 2Q to 2Q. So that's been a great story too. So you see the financial highlights. Um, as you know, you've read all of this. Revenue is up 13.5%. Uh, EBITDA of 15.5. EBITDA percentage at 44.5 is uh, is almost 70 points up uh, year on year. And then uh, profit after tax, as you know, grew 17%. So overall, just a strong story across all key metrics uh, across businesses. Move to the next. Uh, some of the stuff that's on the other chart, I think, in summary, I may have covered, but I'll just go through this. Transaction volumes, you see, was a historic high. 
uh, crossing about 14 crore transactions in a quarter. Uh, similarly, on the unique investor growth, we are now getting very close to 3 crore unique investors at about 2.83. Uh, equity gross sales, uh, again, you see about 67% share in the market. But what stays back with us, uh, gross is always gross of redemptions. When you net it out, uh, that's the 99% share in the last quarter. 80% in this quarter, and again, this is a great number to have on our side, of course, we have to continue watching. This is the cumulative impact of how our AMCs and their schemes are performing in the market in terms of their relative share of sales, but uh, I would say a great number for us to have on our side. And similarly, as you've seen, the SIP juggernaut continues to move in terms of uh, overall SIP registrations uh, in the market. Uh, CAMPS individually is now registering anything between 60 to 65 lakh gross SIPs uh, in a quarter. You see a number of over uh, 30 lakh or 3 million net SIPs. This is net of redemption, or net of uh, SIP expiry and withdrawals. Uh, so that's a great number too. We've never had a number as large as that. And uh, riding on all of this, a live SIP share, like you can see, has grown from 56.1 in 1Q2. Uh, it's grown about 0.7% uh, to 56.8 in the September quarter. Uh, similar numbers, when you juxtapose them with the market, uh, I'm sure you've been uh, watching these numbers closely, so I will not go through this individually. But I think uh, overall uh, equity share gain and equity net sales, uh, uh, overall share has been a great story for us. So has been SIP collection and net SIP is registered. Move forward. Uh, from a transaction volume perspective, uh, you can see almost a 24% year-on-year growth. Uh, points to a degree of retailization when transactions are moving faster than AUM and uh, moving faster than revenue growth. But that's a great story again, because the middle of the pyramid and going towards the bottom is really uh, where a lot of participation will come in these markets as uh, individual uh, you know, transaction sizes and commitments by investors continue to become smaller. But that's a great sign of participation. Uh, SIP book, I spoke about that, grew about 24% year-on-year, 8% year, in the quarter. Uh, you see similarly live folios uh, grew about 18% year-on-year, year, and unique investors about 17%. Uh, systematic transactions process, this is the SIPs that we trigger and collect against each year, grew about 13% on a year-on-year year basis. Uh, from an overall, and I'll give you a short commentary of uh, each of these businesses, uh, as you can see on alternatives, uh, the story continues to be very strong and steady. Uh, we won, uh, from a full service perspective, 15 new to camps logos in uh, 2Q. Uh, WellServe, now we've introduced WellServe 2.0, so which is uh, several notches and steps ahead in terms of uh, digital onboarding and servicing of uh, investors. Now we have 100 plus clients that we've been, uh, you know, naming in the past who have uh, now adopted a digital onboarding capability on on AIF. Uh, Teveno Multifonds, which is part of the fund accounting suite, which we announced in the last quarter, is now ready to take on clients. So we expect to report this to be live and in service in about two months from now. Uh, we also built out uh, and did a beta uh, limited launch of our first analytics platform, uh, WealthTrack, which will uh, which will aggregate data on the on the alternative side, largely on AIF, and then provide contrast just like we do in MFX of you versus industry uh, for industry participants. So also very importantly, Fintuple, which has done we probably in the past bespoke work, has uh, is near conclusion of a very large transformation in one of the uh, top private sector banks. You will see some announcement come from us in December. Uh, so this is uh, starting from uh, their custody operations. This basically integrates every other component of the alternatives uh, operating arena and uh, creates uh, ability for them to share data, onboard investors, and, and just takes out all the wrinkles and creases from the operating uh, setup. So you'll see this announcement um, in December, and uh, as, as the platform goes through a formal launch, uh, this is a very synergistic offering, so whether it is, um, it is uh, video KYC capabilities from both camps and the Think360, 
and uh, several other things, including capsules on RTA operations for AIF. It, it blends in all of that, and uh, and you will see some media press on this in December. Uh, from a sensor perspective, I think uh, the great number is that we are holding at about close to 10% market share. This used to be small single digit till about uh, two to three quarters back. Uh, a number of live FIUs continues to expand and has crossed 50. And I must say that while uh, this was thought of uh, mostly as, uh, you know, lending use cases in terms of, uh, you know, small ticket lending, largely digital lenders uh, adopting account aggregator for uh, credit worthiness of individuals, the other use cases are now becoming very popular. So large broking houses are using this for FNO account opening for calling bank statements. Uh, PFM use cases are now getting bolstered. Uh, similarly, third-party verification uh, are, uh, are use cases now live in uh, in, in several of the uh, brokerages and MFs, etc. So non-lending use cases are now uh, kind of gaining prominence. Of course, this will happen over a few quarters or years, but it's a good first sign to see in the market. Uh, from a payments perspective, uh, we've continued to expand uh, and do well. UPI AutoPay, like we said last time, is continuing to get adopted and may may become over a period of time as the preferred option for uh, SIP payments and recurring payments uh, for individuals. Uh, CAMS KRA, this is something that I alluded to uh, and you may have seen uh, uh, some press and a lot of information on our website, etc. Uh, so we, we brought out this 10-minute KYC solution where it, become, uh, where it enables uh, almost instant onboarding from a from a brokerage team at account and MF perspective has become a very popular solution. And uh, when you bring in all the components of uh, technology that we've done, which is uh, you know things like OCR and face mask, liveliness check, etc., which used to happen in a lagged in time. Uh, kind of format, which is all now getting done quickly. Uh, the the algos and the technology enables all of this, and that's what has enabled us to broaden out the offering to bring in both fintechs and brokerages. It was largely a mutual fund focused offering. We were selling largely to MS, but we've gone beyond that. So we've seen three uh, x increase in monthly volumes, but importantly, almost over 100% year-on-year -year revenue growth. Uh, this, of course, was on a small base. The base was larger. But we expect to see uh, more growth in the coming 12 months as some of these operations stabilize, uh, large customers continue to opt for us, and then existing customers scale. Uh, we expect this to continue growing in the next 24 months. Uh, from a repository perspective, um, you will see, uh, and this is now available in both, um, it is uh, available in both the Play Store and the App Store, uh, utility called Beamer Central, which uh, essentially allows you to open an EIA account and then start linking your policies. But over a period of time, it will allow you to to do various other things, uh, including, uh, like we said, making your payments as, as regulatory things are received, uh, to do lien marking and borrowing monies against your policies, uh, seeing a single screen with all surrender values, Etc. So uh, various augmented capabilities. Now this requires us to tie up with all the almost 50 odd insurers, both in life and non life. Uh, the good news is that the top five have now been signed up uh, for this. Uh, also, from an overall policy perspective, we are 40% uh, up year on year in terms of uh, EIA addition. And uh, like we said, there is sustained interest. While the EIA was a relevant product for the life insurance sector, now the non life Ensure the showing sustained interest on this. So as we uh, continue our journey, uh, continue expanding the number of EI accounts, make the I mean, journey of opening an account frictionless, linking all your policies, and then value-added services of the kind that I said, uh, we will see a lot more interest. Of course, the prerequisite is to bring every insurer on board. That's a process that will take some time. But happy to report this is a unique product. Uh, this is not uh, available with any of the repositories today. And we're expecting to scale on the back of uh, these capabilities. Of course, uh, there is no change in the overall 
uh, overall regulatory position on uh, insurance policies being pushed into DMAX, so that remains uh, as an item which is under work, under progress, but uh, has not finally uh, been declared as mandatory. Uh, from a CRA perspective, uh, we've continued to make um, inroads into the POPs and uh, some progress in the corporate segment. So we continue to retain the number two position in ENPS. And then from a Think360 perspective, um, uh, we've uh, continued to sell quite well uh, the three key products. Uh, and that, that, that story is going well. Uh, from an from a intellectual property perspective, the PFM module on account aggregator is now fully built by Think, and we have uh, acquired several customers. Uh, Think has also introduced into the market a Geo Wealth Index, which uh, which is able to take an address and through various uh, direct and uh, surrogate means is able to establish the potential wealth capability of the individual who resides or rents uh, in that place. And similarly, we are doing some work around uh, generative AI and uh, finding use cases in the market to be able to sell this uh, profitably. So that's the overall story on Think. Uh, like I said, uh, both from a Algo 360 and Quick ID perspective, we continue to scale and, and sign new relationships. Uh, so that's really it in terms of uh, overall operating highlights and what's happened to the different businesses in terms of uh, in terms of scale. Uh, share volumes, etc. I will hand over to Ramkaran so that he can speak uh, about the financials. Thank you, Anuj. I'll just spend a couple of minutes on the broad financial numbers. And as Anuj mentioned, this was a strong quarter from a revenue as well as from a profit perspective. So, revenue uh, for the quarter was 275 crores, which was up almost 13.5% year on year and 5.3% quarter on quarter. Uh, the revenue last quarter, if you recollect, was around 261 crores, and the last year, same quarter, was 242 crores. Uh, this was on the back of a smart growth in the AUM um, and the mutual fund revenue. The AUM, on a year-on-year -year basis, grew more than 20%, uh, translating into MF revenue growth of almost 10%. And on a quarter-on-quarter, -quarter, the AUM grew by 8.7%, uh, translating into a uh, MF revenue growth of 5%. So, uh, tracking the smart growth in AEM, we have been able to grow the revenue uh, almost in line with the growth in AEM, especially on a quarter on quarter basis. Um, the asset based revenue uh, grew 9% and 6% on year on year, quarter on quarter. Uh, we are at uh, 202 crores almost of asset based revenue. Uh, the non asset based revenue uh, uh, grew 13.6% year on year. Uh, we have seen some uptake coming in the applications that we run, including MF Central and various other applications and platforms that we license to the uh, mutual funds. So that's seen a good momentum and continuing momentum on the revenue. And there has been some increase in the call center too on both year and quarter, uh, translating into a smart growth on a year-on-year -year basis of 13.6% on the non-asset-based revenue. Currently, the non-asset-based revenue uh, per quarter is around 38 crores. Uh, Non-MF revenue, Anuj touched upon this. Uh, we have seen uh, uh, a good growth in a non-MF revenue, almost 47% on a year-on-year -year basis, equalizing for Think Analytics acquisition, which was not in the base, even then it's at 30%. So we have seen, uh, you know, uh, what we have estimated is a little ahead of what we estimate in terms of the non-MF uh, revenue growth, and that's translating into the percentage of uh, non-MF revenue being close to 13% for the quarter. Uh, on a, even on a quarter on quarter basis, we saw an uptick of 7.4% on the non MF revenue. See, the non MF revenue is currently around 35.5 crores of the overall revenue. So, we continue to see positive trends on this, especially on the KRA business. Uh, we are seeing, uh, you know, stable to in growth revenue from an AAF perspective. Payments is continuing to do well in terms of the ramp up that they are seeing in the number of transactions. So, all in all, we are on track to meet our targets in terms of increasing the pie of non MF revenue. Uh, the asset mix you will note, uh, you will note for the quarter is actually very favorable. The equity component, which used to be around 45% uh, last year, is around 47.7%, and hence it's translated into some benefit for us in terms of yield. Uh, on the yield commentary, uh, I think in the last couple of quarters or more than that, we had indicated that there is a large contract that is being renegotiated after five years, 
and we had indicated some impact of that will be felt. And uh, during the last earnings call, we had clearly stated that there will be some spillover impact in the current quarter, post which we believe that it will be business as usual. Happy to say that uh, that's been the actual case, and uh, we have concluded the contract, and uh, we are seeing some spillover impact of a marginal decline in yield in the current quarter. Uh, but uh, going forward, uh, our estimate is that we will not see any unusual yield movements, and it will be restricted to the impact of the telescopic pricing, at least for the foreseeable future or the next few quarters. So that's the commentary on the yield. Uh, hence, you will see a small depletion in the yield, but we feel that the uh, the, the impact of all the renegotiations has already been considered and uh, we do not see any big impact going forward on the yields, other than the telescopic impact. Uh, on, the, on the profit perspective, uh, you know, backed by the growth in revenue as well as uh, some operating leverage, productivity and automation and some cost control measures, you will see that we have ended the quarter with a 44.5% EBITDA. Uh, which is equal to or better than the margins that you saw in the, in the earlier uh, mini quarters, right? So we we ended up the uh, we ended the quarter with an operating EBITDA of 122.5 crores, uh, as opposed to 110 crores and a 42.2 percent in Q1 of FI24. Uh, and uh, uh, last year we had 106 crores or 43.8 percent EBITDA. So we are seeing an uh, an uptick in the margin as well as absolute number in terms of the operating EBITDA. This is translating into a, uh, a margin growth even from a PBP and a PAT perspective. And for the quarter, our PAT percentage was close to 30%, 29.7% uh, with a PAT of 84.5 crores. Uh, again, trending upwards in terms of the margin percentages, uh, reflective of our cost control as well as the operating leverage that we feel, uh, is flowing into the bottom end in spite of small depletion yields that we are seeing in the top line. Uh, our return on network continued to be impressive at more than 42% and we ended the quarter, 30th September, we had a cash and cash equivalent of 528 crores. This was after payment of dividend of 98 crores during the last quarter and the board was pleased to declare an interim dividend of rupees 10 per share in their meeting yesterday uh, for which the record date is announced on the 17th. So this, uh, you know, you, when you see the trend going forward also, when you see the trend in the later part of the presentation, you will see that the margin trend as well as the revenue and the PBT percentage absolute numbers are seem to be trending upwards. Uh, which is reiterating the uh, commentary that Anuj and me have given in terms of this being a strong quarter and looking forward to maintaining and, and a minor improvement in margins going forward as we think we have seen the worst uh, all days over in terms of the yield compression over the last few quarters. So this is the commentary I had on the uh, revenue and profit numbers. I'll hand it back to the moderator. Uh, they can open it up for questions. Thank you so much. We will now begin the question and answer session. Anyone who wishes to ask a question may press star and one on their touchstone phone. If you wish to remove yourself from the question queue, you may press star and two. Participants are requested to use handsets while asking a question. Ladies and gentlemen, we will wait for a moment while the question queue assembles. Participants who wish to join the question queue may please press star and one now. The first question is from the line of Mr. Santosh Keshri from Keshri Finance. Please go ahead. <coughs> Yes, you are. Okay. So, congratulations on the set of numbers. I just had one question. One question in that. When you say telescopic impact of the revenue increase in the world. Mr. Keshri, uh, is it possible for you to use your handset while asking a question, please? Oh, sir. Am I audible better now? Yes, sir. Yes. So I had just one question. When you say that the telescopic impact of the revenue initiation is over, what exactly do you mean by that? I do not understand the term telescopic. Yeah, sure. So uh, let me just try and explain that. Uh, the pricing structure that we have with our mutual fund customers is actually scale-based, which is that there is no single BIPs rate that we charge for the asset center management. So uh, uh, we broadly divide this, and while the rates may be different for different customers, the structure is broadly the same for all the customers. Uh, there are asset class based BIPs that we agree upon. For example, equity, debt, liquid, and uh, others on ETFs, passives, etc. 
So, for example, take the equity, uh, the rate of which that we arrive at for a particular customer is not the same. And as the AEM keeps growing, for example, if you had a 5,000 crore AEM of equity, assuming that your BIPs was, say, 7 BIPs, if you get to uh, the next 500 crores, the rate will fall from 7 to 6.5 BIPs. So as you grow in AEM, the marginal billing that we do or the marginal cost for the mutual fund customer keeps decreasing. This is a deliberate inbuilt structure that is there in the pricing agreements with our customers uh, to ensure that the benefits of scale gets passed on to the customers without them having to come back to us every time that there is a big growth in assets. So typically what we see is as the assets keep growing for the mutual fund customers, if your asset growth is say 10, uh, then my asset fee growth is generally between 6 and 7, which is that we have a 30% depletion that generally happens sometimes 25, sometimes 30 that happens between the growth that you see in the assets versus the growth you see in the asset fee, which is what is called a telescopic pricing structure. Okay, so, uh, sorry, then what exactly is the meaning of telescopic impact? The, the grade-wise increase or decrease is not going to happen anymore? No, sorry, uh, what I said was barring the telescopic in, uh, pricing impact because the, ri the rates generally go down because of a telescopic pricing because of any renegotiation, large renegotiation that happens on the base rate itself with the customers. We had indicated during the last few quarters that uh, a large customer's contract for the last five years uh, uh, was renewed just now with a decrease in rates. What we indicated was the impact of that will not be felt further. The only impact you will feel will be the impact of the telescopic pricing. Okay, understood, understood. Thank you so much. That was my only question. Thank you so much. Participants who wish to join the question queue may please press star and one now. The next question is from the line of uh, Mr. Sanal Desai from ICICI Securities. Please go ahead. Mr. Desai, your line is unmuted. Please proceed with your question. Mr. Desai, uh, could you please unmute your line? As there is no response from the line of the current participant. Hello, am I audible now? Yes, sir, you are audible now. Yeah, sorry for the technical problem. Uh, my question was related with the yield movement. As you said that there was a, you know, some effect of the uh, yield reset in this quarter. Uh, in a way, uh, going ahead, uh, also in this quarter, we also saw a big AVM jump. So part of the impact would also be because of telescopic and part of it would be because of the yield reset. Any color which you can share on the extent of decline that we have seen in this quarter because of the uh, yield reset, which will give us a better idea about what to take the yield assumptions for the coming uh, quarters and also the year ahead. Uh, so, you know, <laughs> the, the way to think about this is uh, you saw 20% AUM expansion 2Q to 2Q last year to this year. Normally, you would have seen about a 14 to 15% revenue growth. What you saw is about a 10% revenue growth. The 50 minus 10 is perhaps a broad equivalent of what you're asking for, right? If we did not have that one-time adjustment, then we would have delivered the 14 to 15% on the overall asset growth, which was only 10%. The 50 minus 10 is then approximately the impact of whatever we're talking about. Understood. Understood. So, so going ahead, it will fall back to uh, our historical uh, uh, way of uh, uh, way of uh, decline, which is in line with the telescopic thing, right? That, that's correct. That's correct. So, if assets, let's say, in the next 12 months grow 20 percent, there's no reason that revenue will grow only 10 percent. Revenue should grow 14 to 15 percent. Sure, sure. That that uh, that's uh, really helpful. Thanks a lot. I'll get back in. The no problem. Thank you so much. Before we take the next question, we would like to remind participants that you may press star and one to ask a question. The next question is from the line of uh, Depanjan Ghosh from SETI. Please go ahead. Uh, hi, sir. Uh, good morning. Hope I'm audible. Yes, you are. Yeah. So, just a few questions. First, can you, if I look at your non-asset-based 
uh, mutual fund revenue. You know, this quarter, on a quarter and quarter, it seems to be on a flattish side. You know, given that there are a lot of activities going on in the mutual fund space in terms of be it NFOs or, uh, you know, the market being bound. So I would have expected that, you know, mutual funds would be spending a little bit more on this front. So if you can give some color on that, that's question number one. Uh, question number two is on your non-MF revenues. So if I strip up the uh, KRA business uh, and look at other businesses from a momentum perspective sequentially, uh, like if you look at uh, Think360 uh, over there, it has been relatively flattish or down on a QoQ. So the other businesses have also been you know, not, not, not that great in terms of momentum uptake on the uh, revenue side compared to, let's say, the client wins or logo wins or business expansion side. So just wanted to get some color on that. Uh, lastly, uh, you know, in terms of expenses, uh, can you give some color on increment, incremental costs that you need to incur on the new businesses and what sort of edit the trajectory should we want to see on that? So, uh, thanks, Anjan. I'll, I'll take the uh, question on uh, the non asset based revenue as well as the expenses. And I will uh, request Anush to come in on the non MF business. Uh, see, on the non-asset-based uh, revenue, uh, you know that there are four components major, five components major of it, which is uh, the transaction-based, the miscellaneous application-based, the cost center, the NFOs that we built for, and the out-of-pocket expenses. Uh, what we have seen as a trend is uh, in the last quarter, uh, uh, we have not seen any big increase in the transaction-based assets from a paper transactions perspective. Uh, what we have seen is some moderate increase that's happened from a call center, and from a miscellaneous application perspective. Uh, so uh, while year on year we do see a good increase, uh, you know, in terms of revenue, quarter on quarter it has been flattish. What we expect is, and again, as I was uh, earlier mentioning, we do not expect the non-asset based revenue to kind of propel any growth for us or to propel any profit for us. Because basically the transactions being up or down uh, does not increment or uh, incrementally impact the profits. So we would assume that they will be static within the same levels that we are seeing now. Uh, the only upside that we could see is some increase because of the MF central related revenue that is part of the application base. Uh, that's the only uh, increase that we could probably see to be profitable growth in the entire bucket that we see there. You know, OBU, because of some uh, reasons in terms of uh, you know regulatory issues and all those things, should go up and come down by a crore here and crore there. But all those things are compensated by increase or decrease in revenue. So uh, that's the reason for the non-asset based revenue remaining static on a quarter on quarter basis. From an expenses perspective, uh, I think uh, the major expense increase that you will see uh, will be the salary expenses. Even on a year on year basis, my entire salary uh, head has increased by 7.6 .6 crores. And that includes the uh, salary impact that we have given in April, you know, which is more than six crores. So we have been remarkably disciplined in terms of adding manpower or regulating the cost from a manpower perspective. Uh, it includes the ESOP cost increase. It includes the think analytics cost. Everything put together on a year-on-year -year basis, we have increased cost in a salary only to the extent of 7.6 crores. So we feel that going forward, there will be stable cost that you will see. Uh, in fact, on a quarter-on-quarter basis, if you see the increase in revenue is almost like 13 crores, and the increase in EBITDA is 12 crores. So while that could not be replicated every quarter going forward, uh, we feel that the incremental cost will be measured. It will, and we generally expect 50 to 60 percent of the increase in revenue to flow down as the EBITDA in a in a normal quarter. So from a fixed cost perspective or from an operating expenses perspective, uh, operating expenses generally remain at around seven to seven and a half percent of revenue. Um, Definitely less than 8. That's what they will continue to remain if you remove the OPE part of it. With OPE, they'll be around 12%. The trend has been remarkably stable across the last many quarters that we have seen. The, uh, the employee expenses, as I said, since we're able to control, we're in fact seeing a downward trend. It's a little more than 34% of overall revenue. And your fixed expenses, even on a quarter-on-quarter -quarter basis, you have seen this decreasing. And uh, you know, a couple of quarters back, there was a concern raised regarding why have your fixed expenses gone up. Another point of time, we set expectations saying that you will see this is the peak and you will not see a lot of increase other than inflation-driven increase going forward. I think that's, that's what it's played out in the last couple of quarters too. Um, I, will, I will kind of wait for any questions from you on this or Anuj can probably take the question on the non-MF. So on the non-MF uh, revenue, uh, while we've stated that uh, overall year-on-year -year growth is 47%, Netted for the one-time think analytics revenue, which uh, started accruing in the first quarter, that's about 30%. Uh, 
you are right in this quarter uh, kra has really driven a lot of this growth now last quarter also kra driven growth this has been a substantial quarter from a camps kra contribution perspective uh, however from our overall uh, you know sales focus and signing pipeline etc we are very sure that um, the others which is uh, camps pay uh, think 360 ais and insurance will be large contributors in the coming two quarters but in this quarter you you correct the large part of non mf increase outside of think has been driven by camps care Ah uh, sure. So just if I can ask two more follow-up questions. Uh, one on your AIS side, uh, on the incremental sign-ups, uh, your competitor highlighted that they have moved from a flat fee-based slab to um, to more of a AUM-linked slab, ICC mutual fund. I just wanted to get some color on whether you have also made some changes on that part. Ah, uh, second, you know, more of a structural question. You know, uh, let's say in this quarter, for example, mutual funds or last two quarters, mutual funds have seen very sharp uh, growth in AUM, and some of them have seen change in slab. For themselves on the gross CEA side, uh, your contracts, uh, you know, are more from a two-three year perspective. So when they say can you slap, is it like a direct translation that you have in built in the contract, or how does it happen, or do you expect renegotiations to be much more frequent in this sort of a market trajectory, let's say, sustained hypothetically? No, sure. So when you when you take the first part and whether AIs are moving from flat pricing. to a bit pricing we, we are not seeing that uh, we, we are not seeing that and you must uh, i'm sure you appreciate that the market if i if i just suppose what it was 2 years back to what it is now is a lot more competitive there are a couple of global play, players who are competing uh, the domestics both us and a key competitor so also up the ante so in those kind of competitive scenarios it's not easy to change a pricing paradigm uh, the the current pricing model works well for us so it is continuing uh, the way it is Uh, no large changes we are not reporting any large changes on the mutual fund side just think of these as uh, two separate trains and how do those two separate trains move uh, mutual funds when they grow uh, they will charge as per the tr slab the tr slab can continue falling from you know the numbers right from about 2.25% all the way down to let's say one and some change Uh, so that is something that the mutual fund experiences what we experience is our pricing contract with them which is saying that the telescopic impact i'm just throwing a number may not be very accurate let's say the telescopic impact is is 2% so we will see our contraction irrespective of what change in fees uh, they are undergoing are they using the argument of they change in slab and they change in fee to negotiate something with us the answer is no uh, while they are saying i'm sure there are many schemes which have crossed over to higher and higher slabs it's also a fact that our telescopic uh, our telescopic methodology keeps rates um, at very very affordable levels but it's not a one is to one mapping between what they experience and what we experience Um, got it, sir. And if I can, sorry, one small question on the account aggregator side: Have rates uh, stabilized uh, in the pricing, or how is the pricing pressure out there? Uh, that that was all. Thank you. Yeah, they they have stabilized. The rates are maybe 20-25 percent of where we had started, right? So uh, they have stabilized to a certain level. Uh, competition, of course, in both A and TSP is intense, but yeah, we are seeing some stabilization of rates, sir. Uh, sure. Uh, thank you, uh, sir, and all the best. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of uh, Mr. Lalit Deo from Equity Securities. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi, sir. Good afternoon. Uh, so I have a couple of questions. So firstly, on the on the AI side, so like actually the total AI, so like where you are saying start. Could you please use the speaker? Sorry, the handset mode, and not the speaker mode. If you are using the speaker phone, please. Hello, is this better? Yes, sir. Yeah. So, uh, so coming on the AI revenue piece. So, like, if you see the overall AUM growth in the AI segment, so that has grown materially during this quarter. But since the revenues have not grown, uh, have remained broadly flattish on a sequential basis. So, do we expect that uh, from this growth in the AUM, the revenues could come up in the coming quarters? Uh, that was the first question. 
and second like you mentioned uh, uh, like that uh, uh, because of the renegotiation happening uh, there was some kind of pressure on the de- revenue is so do uh, so what is uh, what is the pipeline uh, over the next 12 to 18 months like is there any major de- de- uh, contract negotiation uh, have, uh, going to take place with our major fund plan correct so from an ar perspective we've seen a, a steady pipeline of signings and therefore yes we are expecting that um, the growth numbers that we've been reporting in the past should be back uh, in the coming two quarters we are quite confident of that uh, the aum does continue to grow uh, every pricing is not aum linked a lot of it is uh, activity linked pricing but that notwithstanding uh, we are seeing uh, significant growth coming back in the next two quarters uh, from a MF perspective, uh, you can see that uh, we had just, I mean, we had stated that uh, there was a large contract where we were resetting prices because of some historical context. Uh, that exercise is now over uh, in the second quarter. Uh, there is nothing major which we believe, and that was like uh, a once in a ten year event, and you've seen that we saw price depletion in a sustained manner for about four to five quarters. In the next four to five quarters, we did not see any event like that happening again. So like Ramcharan said, you can expect a marginal small telescopic rate-led depletion, but nothing major from a price negotiation perspective. Sure. And so this last uh, uh, one data, you mentioned, like you mentioned uh, clarification, like you mentioned that the fixed expenses will be a part will be 12% of our revenue, will be below 12% of the revenue, sir. or was it something else? Sorry, can you just repeat your question, please? Sorry. So the other six expenses, like, uh, as you mentioned, like the operating expenses will be like below 8%, <coughs> below 8% of the revenues, and then there was some 12% of the revenue, so I just missed that part. No, no, uh, I think uh, what we mentioned was operating expenses, uh, if you take the uh, out of pocket expenses, right, which is included in the operating expenses as well as in the revenue, if you just do a division of the two, it comes to 12%. But if you remove the uh, out of pocket expenses from the numerator and denominator, just from the sales as well as the expenses, the real operating expenses that you incur, which is mainly some data entry cost, the sponsor bank charges that they do for the payments businesses, and some things like that. The um, amount will be less than 8%. It is generally between 7.5 to 8%. Uh, that was what I was mentioned on this uh, on this 12% and 7%. Sure. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for the answer. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of uh, Mr. Abhijit Sakare from Kotak Securities. Please go ahead. Hey, hi. Good morning. Uh, I joined the pitch, so some of it could be repetitive. Uh, sorry for that. The first question is that uh, on the non-MF side, uh, there is a little bit of uh, volatility on the insurance. If you could explain that first. And uh, secondly, let's say uh, on a 12-month basis, is there uh, like a visibility on uh, could be the group uh, all of these uh, businesses put together? Uh, I think we're delivering somewhere close to about 20-25%. So does that run rate uh, still hold uh, when you look forward uh, one to two years? Uh, second question is that uh, um, when we look at the overall EBIT margins at around 40%, is it possible to kind of break it down, uh, you know, how the RTA business uh, is doing and, and the rest of the business is doing? And the related one is that uh, uh, are we largely done on the investment front on the non-MF businesses? Uh, so from here on, the translation of uh, revenue growth to bottom line, as as uh, Ram sir mentioned earlier, that should kind of continue uh, as well. Sure. So on the insurance side, while we've been reporting growth in uh, EIA accounts and uh, and uh, policies, you are aware that uh, there's a large fraction of the revenue which still comes from outsourcing services. Uh, in our persistency operations, uh, there was some uh, you know fall off from last year to this year, which is why you've seen a small uh, uh, diminution in the overall insurance revenue. Uh, From a non-MF perspective, we've stated that we would like to grow uh, 20% in revenue terms. And right now, for the next 12 to 24 months, we'll be just holding that number. We expect to grow uh, 20% plus in the overall non-MF portfolio for the next one to two years. Uh, so we're holding that number. Uh, on the third part of the... EBIT on... Uh, 
so uh, abhijit on the ebit part of it uh, yeah you know the the as a bucket the non mf if you kind of uh, combine the non mf versus mf i think that was your question in terms of what will be the split between the two see uh, your uh, mf ebit is obviously on the highest side uh, you know um, it is much higher than the 40% 44% ebit that you are saying there but having said that uh, i think uh, as a as a, if you look at the single bucket non mf might be less but within that af is also equally profitable and cam space is reasonably profitable so uh, non mf mf yes mf is higher ebit than the remaining things uh, but uh, within non mf there is a pocket like af or a payments which continues to be very profitable uh, so that's that's basically the uh, uh, the numbers how they pan out and mm -hmm. kra is, is actually very profitable you know kra is a platform based business so that that profitability is really high so that's that's how it breaks out and that 20% uh, growth uh, rate on the revenue front for non mf uh does that deliver uh, even better uh, growth rate on the ebit or ebit of it 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 will it will uh, for sure because uh, you know as as we said you know from a insurance perspective or from a payments the platform is ready uh, and we would uh, with the incremental policies that come on board and the bima central if it goes uh, in a minute goes live this quarter and start getting some traction from a uh, from a revenue perspective we feel that they uh, that they will be accretive uh, to the ebitda and hence as a business i think both insurance and uh, and the uh, and the payments business could see some uptick in margins uh, insurance definitely payments maybe got it and last one uh, the the core uh, rta business uh, from a opex front uh, there is nothing uh, like a lumpy expense uh, in the pipeline right like uh, all the cloud tech related uh, expenses regulations all of that is behind us right so uh, yes that's right from opex perspective uh, we do not see a big lumpy expense that needs to be done uh, from our side uh, uh, however uh, if there is a big project that we are doing from a technology perspective uh, you know we would probably have to uh you know think about it and that that will be more long term so on the immediate uh, you know a few quarters from our tech perspective uh, we do not see any lumpy expenses that are going to come to you although regulations do continue to come in fact even from a kra perspective there have been regulations on segregation of infrastructure and movement to cloud etc but we are confident of keeping those things under check and you will not see a big lumpy expenses that's coming okay got it thanks a lot Thank you so much. The next question is from the line of uh, Mr. Prayesh Jain from Motila Loswa. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi, hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, firstly, on uh, the core business of uh, we've seen a lot of you know chip addition coming in from the fintech platform, and uh, the transactions that we are doing are coming in from uh, fintech more than you know earlier where we did a lot of paper-based transactions. Uh, so, do you think it, does that incrementally contribute in any form to the revenues apart from the AUM that they add, or how much of our revenues uh, would be kind of have some linkages to the number of transactions as well? Any clarity there? So, first think of it this way that uh, you know that train has been moving for many years now. Think of it as having been moving for the last five years. Uh, we have single AMCs whose uh, paper transactions are in single digits, which means that digital and electronic is 90, 91, 92, 93. Mm -hmm. uh, that kind. Our gross portfolio level paper is 12, so 88% is non-paper. Paper, like we've said, is not uh, is uh, is revenue accretive but not margin accretive. Uh, it also creates risk because once we digitize the paper, then everything else remains uh, identical in our system. The process of digitization takes effort, cost. And introduces a form of risk. So we are very happy with the way things are. Also, do remember that the fintechs have brought unprecedented scale to this market. The scale was not available to the market in the traditional distribution paradigm. The fintechs have brought scale and have brought uh, you know packet sizes which are much smaller. So overall, if you see, uh, we do book revenue from paper transactions, uh, which is not a very large number. Uh, and and even if it is drying up, and it is drying up for the last. I mean, as long as I can think, last seven, eight years, every successive quarter it would have dried up. But the scale, the efficiency that it brings into the system is accretive to us and takes out a lot of labor and a lot of risk. So that's a positive movement for us. The revenue fall-off is a very small sacrifice to make. Well, uh, but that's uh, actually, I'm going to thank you. Uh, 
Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, this is much better. Yeah, so what I'm saying is a uh, 100 rupees sip uh, will still get you fetch you a 3.5 basis point yield and uh, same say uh, 1 lakh rupees sip by HNI would fetch you the same yield. Is that the fair way to look at it or is, is there some uh, or from a cost angle uh, both would require same amount of efforts or from your side or is that the right way to think? Yeah, absolutely. That is the right way to think. Uh, that from an AUM perspective, the 100 rupees sip will be much smaller. It will take a long time to create a mass. And H&I's mm -hmm. 1 lakh rupees sip will be very different in character because it will create AUM much faster. Mm -hmm. But think of the 100 rupee uh, sip to be coming in millions while the H&I sips will be a few hundred or a few thousand. So when you see the scale, we have crossed now 10,000 crore of net monthly SIP collection at just CAMS level. Uh, during the COVID phase, this number used to be four. So in less than three years, we are almost two and a half X. Uh, that kind of scale has been built on distribution and built on, you know, this creation of small sachets. It's not built on H&I's participation in this market, as you can see. So that's really the right thing for the market. It's going in the right direction. The only thing I'll add uh, to your question is, uh, uh, Prayesh, is that uh, the process of this SAP collection trigger is largely automated. So if your question is whether you'll incur the same cost, uh, is the incremental cost that you'll incur and hence 100 rupees is not very beneficial to you, I think the process is largely automated and hence uh, that should not be a big part in this. Got that. Okay. Uh, the other part was on the account aggregator piece. You're hearing that the you know, PSQ bank is still finding it challenging or apprehensive about coming on board uh, for the uh, on the account aggregator platform. And uh, uh, so, what's what's your sense there? And uh, earlier, uh, whenever we used to interact, you said that FI24 will have much more clarity about you know when this account aggregator will start contributing to our revenue stream. Uh, so, any, any thoughts on, uh, on these two aspects of the account aggregator? So, from a participation perspective, every PSU bank is on board, um, each one of them. In fact, uh, most of the private sector banks are on board. The smaller regional rural banks are coming on board. Uh, what you are observing, but you are partially correct, what you are observing with, uh, with public sector banks is that they may not have built the capacity or the finesse in technology for data transmission to be 100%. So if we send 100 requests, will all 100 get answered? The answer is no. Uh, typically in an exchange like this, 60 to 70 should get answered. If you're answering only 10 or 20, then there is something wrong which needs to be fixed. So there are small incidents of that kind, but from a signing and formal participation perspective, all of them are there. I think we are seeing signs of revenue, and that revenue will be, uh, this year would be maybe a few crore rupees, right? So it could be a two, three, four crore rupee number uh, as we progress. But, but but it's a good number to have because it's the beginning of the revenue stream. Uh, we, are, we are pushing through transactions. We have integration charges and sign-up charges. So all of that is happening. Uh, of course, like we told you, that price depletion has been almost 80%. What used to sell for 10 rupees is selling for one and a half and two rupees, so revenue has contracted to that extent. It still remains a very exciting market. I think the good thing to focus on is how many use cases are emerging for how many physical, actual labor intensive processes can you find a substitute through account aggregator. And like I said, whether it is small ticket digital lending, whether it is account verification, part of the KYC process, NFO onboarding, third party verification of bank accounts, there are multiple users. So if you keep your eyes on that, you will find that slowly the manual process will get phased out from the country and these revenue scales will be much larger than what I'm talking about right now. Interesting. And last bit uh, on the EBIT margins, uh, you mentioned um, that you know there are the uh, non-MF businesses are at lower margins as compared to the MF businesses, but you know some of them have uh, are, are doing reasonably good margins. But any of these businesses that can scale up to the levels of uh, the MF business margin, say, in the next two or three years, uh, any, any, any thoughts there? Sorry, so I, I will just give you one example that wherever we have achieved uh, a platform capability, 
which means I have hundreds of small users plugging into a platform. I don't have to deploy too much labor or new development. All I need to deploy is storage, servers, connectivity, ability to manage APIs. Uh, businesses start delivering 40% of better. A great example is our KRA business, which is delivering that margin as of today, uh, after the recent scale-up. Uh, our AIF business is very close to that margin. So they are very close to uh, the, the MF margins. Uh, payments has undergone some pricing pressures effect, uh, recently, so maybe a little lower, but as payments grow, let's say another 30-40% in size, it will start mirroring uh, these numbers. So the good thing about the business, and so will insurance repository be. So, I mean, you can think that as a business, I don't have to scale it to 100 crore. As I scale a business to, let's say, 25 crore of revenue, 20 to 25 crore, it is possible for that business to be at 40% margin, and we are seeing that in MF, we are seeing that in KRA, we are seeing that in AIS. And the ones to watch out for are, let's say, payments and insurance, where you start seeing similar character, maybe three or four quarters from now. Sure. That's very helpful. Thank you so much. Thank you. The next question is from the line of uh, Mr. Jeet Suchak from Nuwama Wealth Management. Please go ahead. Uh, hi, Manman. Thank you for taking my call. Uh, am I audible? Yes, you are. Okay. So for mutual fund business, uh, transaction volume grew year to year 24% and QOQ 10%. So how is it contributing to revenue or uh, cost? If you can give me an idea about that. Most of this is digital volume. Most of it is digital volume. If you see, we do about 60 crore transactions in a year, 55 to 60 crore. Uh, over 80% of this is SIP triggers, and that's a completely uh, digital process from the time we uh, collect all the information about the SIPs being live to do a KYC check of them to, you know, placing them with the sponsor bank, NPCI, etc., to collect the payment to creating the units. It's completely untouched by hand. So uh, it, it, there is no real cost implication there. I, I used to trigger, let's say, two crore SIPs. A few years back, I'm triggering 4 crore. I could also trigger 8 crore. But the quality of processing that we've built and automation is not really cost accretive. From time to time, we will add server capacity and storage, etc. But there's really no labor in this which is managing anything. Okay, and any increment in revenue for the transaction volume? So generally, uh, most of the digital transactions, triggers, SIPs, etc., do not uh, result in any incremental revenue. Also, it's only the paper transactions that generally are uh, are giving us uh, revenue in terms of per paper transaction being processed. So these could not have a large impact on revenue and cost. Thank you. Thank you for again. Thank you so much. That was our last question. I would now like to hand the conference over to Mr. Ram Charan, CFO, for closing comments. Uh, thanks, Sagar, and uh, thank you to all the participants for your uh, participation in the call and the continued interest you are showing in camps. Uh, please feel free to reach out to either Orient Capital or uh, Sri Anish Sarlani, Investor Relations, uh, for any questions that you may have, and Anuj and me are also reachable in case you have any you need any clarifications. So once again, thank you for being part of this call. Thank you. On behalf of Computer Age Management Services Limited, that concludes this conference. Thank you for joining us, and you may now disconnect your lines.